right on Friday? Yeah, I'll be gone on Friday. So no default A conference. <clears throat> <laughs> hmm? You're such a busy man. I'll be here all day today, I think. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Devo 30. Yep, I'm Pastor Ruben and I'm back. <laughs> uh, thank you for joining us today. Hopefully uh, we're all back online. I totally understand it if uh, you're not here today because I haven't been here for, I believe, about a week or so. So... But we do stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And if you ever want to uh, look at an old video that we have done in the past on a certain book, uh, please go to our website at calvarychapelinland.org. Real simple, ccinland.org. And if you go to the media uh, tab and hit it, you'll see that there are a lot of videos on the different books, and you'll get a half an hour commentary on each of those chapters of those books, so it's available for you there. And of course, you can always go to Facebook, but I know it's a little harder to navigate through Facebook to find videos of a certain uh, of a certain book in a certain chapter, so it's easier just to go to the website. And if you're in the neighborhood, come on by. We're here at nine o'clock, some of us earlier than that. In fact, the church is open uh, usually by six o'clock if you wanna come by and just pray and meditate. I know some people do that. They're here and they're doing their devotions themselves. You're more than welcome to do that. Today we are going to finish up 1 Timothy and we are in chapter 6. And finally we have one person viewing. Welcome. Glad you guys <laughs> found us. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and pray and we'll get into uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity, Lord. It's always a blessing to open up your word and to read it, Lord. And we pray, Lord, as we uh, go through this 30-minute devil, Father, that you would just lead and guide me, Father, in those areas that you want to shed some light on, Father, today. I don't know what they are, Father. I don't know where your people are at, but I know that your spirit will minister to all of us right where we're at, Lord. And if it's not something that we are going through at the moment, Lord, that maybe it's just to equip us for the future, Father. So give us ears to hear what your Spirit has to say, Lord. And just give us the simplicity of the gospel, Father. As the Apostle Paul is encouraging this young man, Timothy, who's in the ministry, and ministry, those of us that know, can be very, very difficult at times. And Paul is just trying to encourage him and give him some guidelines and how to handle certain situations within the church. There are so many varieties of people and thoughts and beliefs, oh Lord God, that it can be so confusing for people, Lord. And ultimately, Lord, all of us have to make that decision, Father, to just be in unity to your word and simply your word, Father. And so we're just praying, Lord, that your word would be our grid of truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Okay, so again, good morning. Thank you for joining us. We are in 1 Timothy chapter 6. <clears throat> and again, just to restate what I, I prayed for, which I think is so important. <clears throat> uh, Ephesians is so clear when Paul uh, ministers to us concerning the body of Christ and how God calls, calls uh, some to be pastors and, and teachers within the church and evangelists and so forth to equip the saints you know, for the work of the ministry in Ephesians chapter four, uh, verse 11. But he goes on and, and says in verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to, the perfect, to a perfect man, to the measure and statute of the fullness of Christ. So God's purpose is for us to all be in unity. And of course the, the struggle is, uh, yeah, I think we would all agree and say, yeah, we need to be in unity, but what is the truth? That's where we struggle, okay? What, what truth is it that you want us to be in unity? Now, we obviously all agree that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for us and that he resurrected from the dead. So there's a unity there. So when it comes to that doctrinal uh, truth, we all have to be in unity there. It's the other stuff that we sometimes struggle with because we disagree with one another. And I think that's why the Bible says that we should love one another above all things. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 22, 
that the greatest commandment is love God, and the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. So love always trumps everything else. You learn to disagree agreeably. But again, his purpose is for us to be in unity. So let's understand the culture <clears throat> of the times <clears throat> so that we can understand the truth of what Paul is saying of that time. So during the time of Paul, and you can even go further than that, and you can even go to our nation as uh, in its earlier stages, there's always been servants, slaves, uh, people who have <coughs> enslaved other people to get work done. Uh, in our country, it has been outlawed uh, at this point because... Uh, masters have treated their servants very badly uh, and hurt them. They maybe even killed them because they were looked at and considered to be property and not human beings. And rightly so, I agree with that. But Paul had to deal with it during this time. Did that stuff happen during the time of Paul? Of course it did. Uh, but at that time, it was well known and well needed at the time because of the, um, the lack of a social program that was... Uh, implemented by the government at that time, there was none. And so people needed to work. And God had created, um, in a sense, that you could sell yourself as a slavery, a system, where you could sell yourself for so many years, and hopefully that amount would take care of your family while you were serving, and then when your service was over, you'd go back home. And it was almost like a, a, an employee employment type of thing. And again, unfortunately, uh, people who were the employers would take advantage. That still happens today, right? We see lawsuits against Amen. sexual harassment um, and various things like that. We call them employees, em employees, employers, work. It, to a degree, you might say that they're slaves to their company and there shouldn't be insubordination. You're to submit to your bosses because that's what you agreed to do. There's just a little more legalities as far as, uh, and rights to those that are employees as well as employers. So understanding that, understand what Paul is saying here in chapter six. He says, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor so that the name of God and his doctrine may be or may not be blasphemy. So <clears throat> apparently Timothy is dealing with people in the church that are slaves to other people. They're attending church and they are, I guess, complaining about their masters being harsh, being mean, uh, being not fair. You know, all of those things that, that we probably would see today. And so Paul is encouraging the slaves to, to look. If you have a master, uh, you want to be a witness to that master. You want to represent Christ as best you can. So treat that master with honor. And if you treat him with honor, God will take care of you. Does it mean the master will be better to you? Not necessarily. I mean, I'm sure he could see that you're a great servant and he could have some favor on you, but it doesn't mean that will happen. But it does mean that if you are faithful to honor God, by honoring your master, that God will be faithful to take care of you. Uh, does that mean that uh, you may um, survive maybe uh, some harsh things? Yeah, it may that you might not survive it, but it's gonna be God who rewards you in the end uh, when you get to heaven. So ultimately it's that bigger picture in the future of being in heaven and then us being light and salt in the world. Then he goes on, and by the way, it doesn't mean that Paul agrees with slavery. He's just telling you, this is the culture we live in. This is the day and age. This is how we should handle ourselves. Uh, we represent Christ, and we should represent him correctly. Otherwise, God and his doctrine is blasphemy. People say, well, you call yourselves Christians. You know, well, that's not how Christians act. Oh, well, you're right. That's not how Christians act. And so we need to correct those things. And he goes on in verse two, those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. So Timothy is encouraged to teach these things to the church. That's the responsibility of the pastor. Um, it's not always easy, but sometimes it's the, <laughs> the simplest things that need to be taught to people. You know, like how to treat other people. That, that's, you would think that would be common sense, but if we're not reading our Bible and we're not surrendered to Christ and we're not really uh, seeking God uh, in the sense that uh, we're seeking God to have our own lives changed, not others' lives, but my life changed to be more like Him, then yeah, uh, our treating people uh, may be different than what God 
would intend for us. So we have to, we have to look at what God says about treating people. And of course, he, he took it to the ultimate, didn't he? When he said, love your enemies, love your enemies. Now that pretty much says <coughs> it all, that we should love our enemies. <laughs> then he goes on. He says, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, and wholesome words is just respectful speaking, you know, do not be little, do not be angry, just be gentle and speak kindly. Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words which come, which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, unless wranglings, useless wranglings of men, of corruption, my, of corrupted minds, and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourselves. Wow. <laughs> this, is, this is an interesting scripture in light of what has been happening here in our church that this would all of a sudden come up um but yeah the, the, this here is so clear how we ought to approach one another um if there are arguments and disputes the best thing to do is just to withdraw yourself from that person uh, you're wasting your time uh, a person that wants to argue they love arguing uh, they like fighting uh, they like debating uh, they like to hurt others and as they have said and have proven against bullies, the best thing to do is agree with them. You know, you can disarm them. And I've, sh I've been sharing this, it seems like, lately. But the best way to disarm a bully is just to agree with them. You know, a bully wants to start a fight. He wants to poke you in the side and get you to react. And if he comes up to you and says, you're a little wimp and I can kick your butt. The best thing you do is say, yeah, you're right. I'm a little wimp and I'm sure you can kick my butt. See you later. Thanks for the information. Bye. What are they going to do? How are they going to respond? No, didn't you hear me? I called you a wimp. I know, you're right. I'm a wimp. See you later. They're not going to be able to you know, come back at you. But if you sit there and say, I'm not a wimp. Come on, let's go for it. Now you got to fight. Now you're in all of these discussion disputes and you're angry and you're upset. And you know, it just, everything. And everything that comes with it, the suspicions and why you did it, the motives and you know, all of that stuff has to play instead of just walking away. It's better to walk away. Someone posted in Facebook about, about, um, in a sense, it's like being the strongest person. Uh, Yvonne probably posted because she always posts those kind of kind of books. <laughs> there's, a, there's a picture of Keanu Reeves, and you know, it's just like be the strongest person, be the wisest person, you know, and but yet be able to turn around and walk away and not do anything. So there's just something that said about that. Jesus was great at that, right? You know, yeah. he would just answer and then move on. A lot of times, he just answered with a question, you know, just to get them to think. Um, like if someone came up to you and says, you're a puny little guy, I could probably kick your butt. You know, the question, then you can answer with a question. So how did you come up with that conclusion? Um, oh, and they'd have to stop and think. Well, so what is your purpose for saying that? You know, just questions like that, you make them think. And, and, and I probably am, and then you walk away. You walk away. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. That's a great uh, principle to learn. Godliness with contentment. Being content with what you have. What God has given you. <clears throat> For being the poorest man to walk around, you could see the contentment in Jesus Christ. Nowhere to lay his head. Nowhere to call home. And yet he was content. He was content in living that righteous life. That is a great principle, and it it really is applicable in so many different areas of our life, whether it's food, whether it's material things, whether it's housing, clothing, um, whether it's position or status. You know, being content where God has you, because God has you exactly where He wants you, and so in that place, in that spot, you are to be godly, righteously godly. For we brought nothing into the world, and certainly we cannot carry anything out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who despise to be those who despise to be rich fall into desire to be rich, sorry, 
Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Um, and he's talking, of course, of eternal uh, life. Those that will walk over anybody just so they can gain what they want. And become rich and we know there's a lot of people like that but ultimately in the end they stand before God and God will destroy them so it's not something that we should do you want that contentment to come don't don't strive to be rich if God allows you to be rich great you have great ideas and, and you're able to sell that great let God be the the one that blesses that and then use that for his glory and then he gives us uh, the, the reason why these men find this sorrow. He says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Wow. For the love of money, by the way. It's not money, but the love of money. And many love money. Many love money. Um, our topic last night in, in our discipleship class was about the parable of the talents and we got onto the subject of giving money because that parable is talking about a sum of money and how you invest it into the kingdom of God and that's what Paul is talking about here that if you love money then you're not going to invest it in the kingdom of God because your love is for money and for self and so you'll spend it on yourself more than you will on the kingdom of God and so Paul is trying to make a point here on those that are rich in the church that Timothy is uh, pastoring and he needs to teach these things to those that are wealthy within the church that they have a responsibility to be faithful stewards to God in supporting his work and so he says here that if they love money uh, they're going to stray from the faith. And we see that. I remember years ago, a friend of mine was telling me about one of their friends playing, playing the lottery and how they were going to church and, you know, involved and so forth. And he said that they won the, won the lottery. It wasn't like an outlandish amount of money, but it was enough that all of a sudden they stopped going to church and they were enjoying life. You know, so here we go with, with the perfect example of them loving the money and then the money, you know, caused them to stray from the faith. And money will do that. Sometimes I ask God, is it because I'll stray, Lord, that you have not given me any money? <laughs> you know? And if that's the case, then good, good Lord, just meet my needs, you know, my daily needs. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, gentleness, I'm sorry, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of of many witnesses. Boy, if we were just to take our time to seek after these things, we would be so occupied with this that we wouldn't be able to do bad things. We wouldn't be seeking other things. Seek after these things if you're gonna seek anything. Uh, spend your time all day long you know, pursuing righteousness. How can I be righteous right now in this situation? How can I be godly in this situation? How can I have faith right now? How can I love right at this moment? How can my patience grow? I know people say, well, don't pray for patience because it'll not put you through things. Not necessarily. We need to just be patient with things. We need to be patient with God, patient in, with ourselves, patient with people, not just respond immediately and just take time. It, it's a practice of these things. And we should be practicing these things every day, uh, looking for opportunities to grow. So fight the good fight. Lay hold of our, our eternal life. I urge you, verse 13, that you might, that in, you, in the sight of God, uh, who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until uh, our Lord Jesus Christ is appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potent or sovereign God, is what that word potent means, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. So Paul is encouraging Timothy uh, to seek after these things because it leads to our sovereign God, who has all power and mighty, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that is our purpose, is to seek after him, uh, to please him. That is our main purpose. And if we as believers were just to stop in this hectic life of ours and chaotic and narcissistic 
and just say, Lord, I am here to please you and not anyone else. Help me to do that, Lord, to be that light in this world. But to please you and to only please you and to seek you and to live that godly life that you have called me to. Timothy was to do that and he was to train the church to do the same thing. Now he goes on to close, verse 17, <clears throat> with an exhortation to the rich. So he's talking about those that are wealthy again, how they fall into snares, but, but we want to know how they should act. And so he's giving instructions on how they should act and what they should do with their money. And this is always a, a hard place for a pastor this coming Sunday, and I probably shouldn't say this because people won't come to church, but I'll be talking about uh, Paul, uh, talking about uh, the church supporting the Apostle Paul and those that are in ministry because this is how they uh, survive in the ministry and those that are in the church and are being blessed by the pastor, by the leadership. You know, if they're being blessed, then uh, those that are blessed should also support the leadership with their material things. And he's talking about, you know, money, uh, take care of their needs. And there's a way of doing that today, just as there was a way of them doing it in Paul's day. Paul would take up an offering. You know, and of course, <clears throat> he was taking up an offering in Corinthians for Jerusalem because there was a famine there. And he was telling them, I want you to prepare beforehand. I don't want to come and then preach it and have a fun drive and, you know, get everybody to donate. I want you to beforehand have it ready. And when I get there, Give it to me so I can go and, and take it. So there's a responsibility for the church to, to be wise with it and pur purposeful with it too. There's a reason for it. And so we got to know what we do with it. Now that he's rebuked the rich, uh, you know, saying that they're loving money and all they care about is that money uh, and it's misleading them and destroying them, even their eternal life. He says, what is the proper way for us to act with uh, money, those of us that have it? So verse 17, command those who are rich in this present age, not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in, the in, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. I just want to make a, a point here. And, and he, he made the point, I think, very clearly here that they trust in uncertain riches, right? So they're trusting in their riches. And he's saying, do not trust in your riches. So in other words, have faith in God that he is the one that provides for you and that you have to have faith in God that he is the one that's going to use those funds accordingly. So when you tithe, when you tithe, you're tithing by faith, right? Because you have no control <coughs> over that money at all. You're believing that you're giving to the church and the church is going to use that to maintain the building, to maintain the bills, you know, the electricity, the water, and those lights, to maintain the salaries, to maintain the medical for, for those that are in leadership and things like that so they can live just as comfortably as you probably live. So that takes faith, right? Compared to if you trusted in, in money, you're in control of it. <clears throat> and there are some that like to have control because they can see where their money is going. So I'm going to give to this, and I'm going to watch that become something. So now I have a certain control. So they're not having faith. They're just trusting that their money and their decision is going to work right because that's what they're investing in. So the problem is, the problem is, is that people don't have faith when they give. It's a faith issue more than anything else. I think they know that God calls us to tithe. I think they know that. The problem is they don't have the faith to believe that God is our provider. <clears throat> and so that's why he's saying here uh, to, to trust in uncertainties, nor to trust in uncertainties. Uh, riches, but in the living God, trust in Him more than anyone else, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Who gives us richly? Uh, that is God who gives us. He's the one that provides for us. Um, why does one man become rich and another doesn't? It's because God's grace. Uh, he knows how that person will use it. Uh, he has a purpose for it. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works ready to give, willing to share. So this rich person needs to do good with his riches. Now he chooses what to do good with. Uh, he chooses uh, those works and he's willing to give and to support and willing to share. Storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they uh, may lay hold of eternal life. So their reward will be in 
in heaven. I think it was J.C. Penney's I heard a story of that was a Christian that he started that company and he told the Lord, I will give you 10%. And then as you increase the, the, uh, the prosperity of the store, I'll give you more. And he was at a point where he was giving a 100%. He didn't need anything anymore. He was giving 100% of his, his wow. money to charities and works throughout the, the world. So the wealthy have a responsibility. The problem is that the wealthy, um, the Christian, and I'm talking about the Christian wealthy, don't all see that. They'll give a small amount out of the great amount. That was the issue with Jesus and the widow's might, right? Look at the religious leaders, how much they give, right? But they're giving out of their abundance. So if you have a million dollars and you give $100,000, that's what? That's 10%. And that's a lot of money. But if you have one might and you give it all, that's how much? 100%. So who's greater? The widow. The widow. Even though that little might can't do much, but it's the attitude of faith that she had. Now, ask that person to give a million dollars and then see where they're at. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money. Reminds me of a story of two other brothers who started a company and they told the Lord they'd give them 10% uh, if they would increase the company. And the Lord blessed them, so they were giving, you know, uh, at first it was $100,000, then it was $500,000, then it was three million dollars, and then it was five million dollars. There was a point where they were having a meeting and they were going, wow, we're giving away $5 million a year, that's a lot of money. I mean, imagine what we could do with that, how we could use that if we were just not to give it to the Lord. I mean, there's gotta be a way out of this, they started thinking. So they prayed and, and asked the Lord, and this is, I don't know if this is a true story or not, but the story goes on to say that they said, Lord, uh, we we're hoping that maybe we could give less than $5 million. He goes, sure, no problem. I'll make your company get smaller. <laughs> so. The Lord has a way of doing that. And so the moral of the story is, you know, be faithful with what God has given you. Trust in Him and don't trust in your riches. Don't trust in your own wisdom. Trust in God. And then he goes on, Oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. Avoid uh, the profane and vain babbling and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. So apparently he was dealing with the Greeks. And, and their hunger for knowledge. And of course, Paul calls their knowledge babbling contradictions here, profane. In other words, Timothy, be faithful with what I have taught you. And what I have taught you is what the apostles have been taught by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Be faithful with the doctrines of God. Be faithful to the word of God. Be faithful to what you have learned in the ministry and don't give in to these others. So apparently there was pressure on Timothy by these, uh, whether they were believers or pretending to be believers. And so Paul's encouraging him. And he says, by professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. 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 I mean, there, this chapter is so awesome. There's so much in this little chapter for us to, to learn from. And I wish that we could just take so much more time uh, with it, um, it would help us out in so many areas of our life. And it would definitely help out the church. It would probably lessen a lot of the, the sufferings that the church goes through and the stress and, and the drama that's in the church too if we were just to hear Paul's words. Someone has said that no matter how small a church is, uh, there is enough money within that church to change the community if everyone was to tithe. And the issue is they don't tithe because they don't trust in God to take care of their finances. <clears throat> they trust in themselves more than God. And that's a sad place to be. Um, and I know that there's various reasons, uh, and we talked about that last night, that how people can justify, you know, well, I got this big bill coming, so I'm gonna stop giving to God so I can take care of this bill. So, so now God's not gonna be able to handle your bill, and you've got to handle it so you're and what does Malachi say very clearly? You're stealing from God if you're not giving your tithe and offerings. So now you're stealing from God to pay your bill. And that's literally what's happening. And by the way, Malachi is the only book that talks about tithes and offerings and the blessing that comes with it. That's a blessing. That's a promise for us that if we tithe, God promises to bless us, to increase us. And he's faithful in that. And you can tie Malachi in with uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 where Paul talks about uh, those who sow sparingly, reap sparingly. Those who sow 
bountifully, reap bountifully. Same principle, right? That's what God is saying. You don't give me your tithes, then this is what's going to happen. You're not going to receive your vineyards and blah, blah, blah. If you give me your tithes, then I will bless your vineyards. <clears throat> Paul says the same thing. You sow spar sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. Your crop will be less than what you expected. And so that same principle, why? Because God's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Amen. Tithing is a principle that God has given to us, and it's taught in the New Testament. And pastors that, and I'm going to say this, pastors that don't teach it are in error for not teaching it, and they're robbing God's people. They're robbing God, too, and they're teaching God's people to rob God. Uh, they need to look at the Greek and the Hebrew, and they need to understand the, the flow of the Old Testament to the New Testament. God has fulfilled the law. doesn't mean that we don't keep the law. We're not saved by the law, and it shows us that we are sinners against God, but the principles are to be kept within the law, unless God specifically says not to keep it. So that's clear, and that principle is there in the Old Testament, before the law, during the law, and during grace. Jesus even told the religious leaders, you tithe on your mints and little spices, and he says, and that's good, and continue to do that, but also add grace and mercy to that too. So it's one that's taught. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you, Lord, for your precious word. And Lord, we do pray for those that are wealthy and rich, that they would uh, take their, their riches, Lord, before you. And Lord, that you would direct and guide them in how to spend their wealth in your kingdom and for the betterment, Father, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. I know it's been a while, but we won't have a Devo on Friday. I'll be at a conference, so we'll resume uh, next week on Monday, and then hopefully from there go on, at least until October, and then I'll be gone for a couple of weeks for my short missions trip. God bless you. I, I pray that the Lord will bless you today and, and take care of the things that you uh, plan on doing today. Have a wonderful day.